Thank you, David. Uh, just uh, I'm next. I got a uh, just a quick story uh, since it's kind of Renan's day here as well. I want to thank Dr. Woolley for his kind words about Renan. When I first came to MUSC, uh, Dr. Wallman called me about I don't know a month a month into my fellowship. I mean my job. Uh, I wasn't a fellow anymore. He asked me how I was doing, just checking up. And do you do tips? I go, oh yeah, we do tips. We do a lot of tips. And he goes, and, and I yell at our fellows all the time, you gotta go faster, you gotta go faster. You go, we're never going home, you're never gonna feed your family, you gotta go faster. I learned that from David. And, uh, and he goes, hey, did you tell those people down there that you can do a tips in 30 minutes? Cause you know, we timed that one that you and Dave Lee did together and you did it in 30 minutes. And I go, no, Dave, I don't talk about that kind of stuff. He goes, why not? That's a great time for a fellow to do a tips in 30 minutes. I said, well, you know, the first week I was here, I saw Renan do one in 25. So <laughs> it, it doesn't come up very much. So anyway, uh, just some thoughts about Renan. And, and uh, he loved this procedure as well. Uh, I think this was his favorite thing to do as well. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, hemodynamic pressure changes in tips. I think uh, everybody's kind of touched on little pieces of this along the way, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about what we see going on in, in, in pressure changes in tips. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the hemodynamic environment of the cirrhotic patient. I, actually, Dr. Koch has already done that uh, much better than I could ever hope to do. Uh, now we're going to talk about hemodynamic changes after TIPS and the risks of uh, increasing the, the central venous pressure after TIPS is done, and then describe our experience in trying to predict how much the central venous pressure will increase after a 10 millimeter uh, TIP stent is placed. Um, uh, and David uh, Wallman already talked about this. The first uh, stent in a patient was done by Dr. Richter in Germany, and that first patient died of respiratory distress after the TIPS was placed. He had a lot of success after that and inspired everybody to, to uh, look into this procedure for themselves, but the first patient uh, uh, didn't do so well, and it's th this patient population that I want to talk about. Uh, as David said, uh, our whole goal is to reduce the gradient between the portal and systemic uh, veins uh, in people that uh, fail, uh, that are symptomatic and they fail medical or endoscopic management. And as he also alluded to in the lysis patients, uh, in the thrombectomy patients, it, it provides a window into the system that has a problem so that we can do things like lysis and plasty and, and, and things like that. Um, not procedural complications, post-procedural complications that we see are uh, due to hemodynamic changes because of the tip stent that's placed. We're shunting this large volume of uh, splanchnid blood into the systemic circulation bypassing the liver. Uh, these patients have liver failure and cephalopathy and uh, not very common anymore, but back in the day, radiation injury. Um, uh, liver failure, uh, as Dr. Wallman alluded to, the portal vein uh, supplies a lot of the, of, of the, of the supply, uh, blood supply to the liver, and we're going to shunt all that blood away from the liver, and if the hepatic artery can't step up and do the job, uh, then the liver will fail. Um, we see uh, uh, marked elevation in T-billy and elevated LFTs, and if this doesn't normalize or improve after a few days, then we have to talk about stent reduction or taking the stent down completely because they'll die of liver failure. Encephalopathy is probably the post, most common post-procedural clinical complication. Uh, up to a third of the patients are affected in some manner according to the literature and uh, uh, the vast majority of these uh, patients are uh, addressed with diet restriction and lactulose and sometimes if they don't respond to those uh, medical maneuvers, uh, they require stent reduction or uh, occlusion as well. Uh, when I first started my residency in Rochester, I did some of these tips, and I think this is where David's uh, uh, policy of if you're not in the portal vein in 45 minutes, you have to call somebody else, because I was doing a tips on call. I'm not gonna tell you who I was doing it with, but nobody here knows them anyway. And uh, Dave said, I understand you did a tips last night? I go, yeah, how long did it take? Six hours. And uh, he goes, no, no, we can't have that. So that's where the policy actually I don't know if that's where the policy started but I think it might have uh, we don't get this we're, we're like you if we're not if we're not in the portal vein in the first hour we're starting to get itchy uh, and so we don't use as much radiation near as much radiation as we used to uh, dr. Koch already talked about this so the, the end-stage liver disease patients uh, producing a, a hyperdynamic circulation uh, and it was first described in the 50s and uh, later found to be nitric oxide mediated and a lot of is multifactorial neurogenic uh, 
uh, receptor uh, deregulation, um, all, all kinds of things, and uh, at least all the things that Dr. Koch talked about in his talk. Uh, what happens after we put the tips in is we make that hemodynamic circulation even worse. Uh, uh, all the early papers in the mid-90s show uh, consistently in their series that uh, we're putting a, quite a strain on the, on the heart and the circulatory system in general after a tips is placed in these people that are already stressed uh, in this regard. Um, at first we thought that this is just a, a short-term thing and then it will equilibrate uh, fairly quickly. Uh, later papers at the, in, the, in, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s show that these effects actually linger for up, a, up to a year. Uh, so after the TIPS is placed, uh, we have to watch these people closely for some time to make sure that they can handle uh, the, their, their new environment. Uh, so what we see is we see increased right atrial pressure, uh, we see uh, increased cardiac index, increase, we can have increased part, uh, pulmonary hypertension, um, and it can be fatal in patients, especially in patients that have uh, uh, some aspect of diastolic dysfunction before the TIPS is going, going in. Uh, uh, so how do we predict uh, who's going to do well with a TIPS? Uh, well, uh, if you can go to ECHO and uh, they, can, they can measure all kinds of things. And one of the things that was borne out uh, more recently was the, uh, the, the ventricular filling velocities or the EA ratio at the mitral valve. And in normal patients, early filling is, is much brisker than late filling across the mitral valve. And when that ratio is flip-flopped and they have some element of diastolic dysfunction, we put a TIPS in those patients, they increase their preload and they don't do well. Uh, so it'd be nice if everybody could have a right heart cath. It'd be nice if everybody could have an echo. Uh, a lot of the tips that we do are people bleeding out of their mouth in the middle of the night and they don't have time for those things. Uh, so what do we do? Is there anything we can do in interventional radiology? Uh, we measure very few things along the way when we're doing the tips, but are, is any of the data that we collect uh, predictive of where we're going to end up uh, with regards to right atrial pressure if we just assume all those people have some element of diastolic dysfunction? And if we can, what do we do with that information to begin with? So we, I looked at, uh, well, all of us looked at uh, 125 uh, consecutive patients for tips and just looked at the pressure measurements that we had along the way before and after the tips. Uh, more. Uh, men than women, more bleeding than ascites. Uh, most of them had cirrhosis and most of them were uh, either alcohol or hep C uh, related. Uh, our technical outcomes were good. Uh, we, uh, we, we either reduced the gradient by 50% or reduced it under 12 and 95% of the patients that we saw. Uh, the pre-tips gradient, whether you like means or medians, was 22, 23 millimeters of mercury when we started. And we reduced that by 16 or 17 millimeters of mercury down to 6 or 7 millimeters of mercury, which is a nice place to be under 12. Uh, uh, also, what we saw was uh, the mean right atrial pressure before we started was somewhere around seven or eight millimeters of mercury, uh, and the wedged hepatic venous pressure was around 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, and, and so that's all the data we collect before we start making the stick over to the portal vein. Uh, once we get into the portal vein and we measure direct portal pressure, again, we see the main portal vein pressure is 30 millimeters of mercury, which isn't to be unexpected because the wedged hepatic vein and the main portal vein are very highly correlated. After the tips is placed, we see a rise in the right atrial pressure to about 13 or 14 millimeters of mercury from the seven or eight uh, the, where we started, and we see a decrease in the portal pressure from from uh, 30 millimeters of mercury to about 20 millimeters of mercury. So we do reduce the gradient, but it's not just because we're reducing the pressure in the portal vein. We're also, we're reducing that pressure and at the same time increasing the pressure in the right atrium and making that difference less, which makes the, the varices stop and the ascites get better if we're lucky. Uh, so how do we predict where we're going to end up with the right atrial pressure? We all fear ha leaving this patient with a right atrial pressure up in the 20s after we, after we put the tips in. Uh, so one thing that should probably be in the model is if we start in a high place, we're going to end up, and we know we're going to end up in a higher place, we need to put in the model what the right atrial pressure was to begin. Uh, and we can see here on the x-axis, uh, we have the uh, pre-tips right atrial pressure. On the y-axis, we have the post-tips right atrial pressure, and you can see the positive correlation. It's not a very good fit, but we can see there's concordance of data from left to right. Uh, 
Uh, and another thing that made sense to put in the model was what is the wedge to paddock venous pressure? We haven't made a stick yet, but we're going to just assume that that's the portal pressure. Uh, the higher that is, the more blood we're probably going to be putting on the right heart once we open up that vascular bed to the, straight to the right atrium. And we can also see a positive concordance of data here. Uh, uh, so what we decided is to build a model with uh, uh, the independent variables of wedge hepatic venous uh, pressure and right atrial pressure and see if we could predict what the post tips right atrial pressure with a 10 millimeter stent would be. And we can explain about, about 94, 95 percent of the variability and adding the wedge pressure to the pre, before we just measured right atrial pressure and said, yeah, we can do it or no, we can't do it. Adding the wedge to paddock venous pressure to the model actually significantly lowered the standard error or the predictability of where we're going to end up. Uh, the red line here is perfect correlation uh, between uh, on the x-axis is post uh, tips right atrial pressure and in the y-axis we have uh, 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 pre-tiffs right atrial pressure. I don't know if I have a laser pointer here or not, do I? The top? Yeah, it's not working. Oh well. It, 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 you, we can see there's a, a fairly good fit of the data and if we look at the line coming uh, across at 20 millimeters of mercury, everybody above that line had portal hypertension at the end of the TIPS procedure. And if you draw a line up from 20, we can see everybody to the right of that line was who we would predict would have it, and, uh, or, or vice versa. So we can see that everybody that we predicted to be above 20 millimeters of mercury, uh, three of them didn't and 10 of them did. So we were pretty good at determining who was going to be above 20 millimeters of mercury before the TIPS was placed. We did miss four people that we predicted would be low, and they ended up to be right on the border around 21. 22 millimeters of mercury. So what do we do with this? Well, uh, if we can predict what the right heart pressure is going to be before we even put the tips in, that may allow us to put uh, a variable size stent in. When we're doing the ascites patients, we know sometimes we need a larger stent than, than, than the bleeders do. And we always, uh, at our institution, we put it in a 12 millimeter stent uh, for the acidic patients, and we only dilate it to 10. And then if, if the ascites doesn't get better, we, has, we still have some room to dilate more, but we don't, we don't open it up all the way unless we need to. We could do the similar thing for bleeders. We could put in a 10 millimeter stent, and if we predict that their right atrial pressure uh, would be too high with that 10 millimeter stent, we can just decompress it up to 8 millimeters and still leave us room uh, to, to, to balloon more, or we could embolize the varices, as, as Dr. Wallman talked about earlier. So that's all I have to say. A lot of this is going forward. This is just kind of where we are right now with this. So thanks. Any questions about anything? No, uh, usually Dr. Koch has already done that. No, you don't know? No, no, no. Uh, we, we care about things like uh, uh, MELD scores and, 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 and uh, Billy Rubens and, and right heart pressures. Those are the three, and patal, uh, portal patency. Those are, the, those are the big ones that I look at before we, we grab it and growl. Anything else? All right. Yeah, Tom? Uh, maybe naive question, but if you're worried about suddenly increasing the right heart pressure, Why not just draw off 500 milliliters or, or so of blood at the time uh, to at least for a while give the heart a little bit of a rest? I think that. That's a good question. I don't know if that would work or not. I'd have to think about it. I never thought about it in that manner. I think that 500 you take off, I think that effect wouldn't last more than a few minutes. But I don't know. The other problem is those people typically have a Yeah, they're already bleeding. Yeah. The, the effect lasts for so long that I think that would be a temporary solution to a chronic problem. I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to think about it. Anything else? Thanks. That's a good question. Now you got me wondering. Uh, thanks. You're good for that. <laughs> Tom Brothers, vascular surgeon at MUSC, challenges us every day. I love it. I love working there.